differentiate yourselves from all those competitors out there. And that's an important part of your story because it really has to, has to do with how do you make your story rise above the pack. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Entrepreneurship 101. I'd like to introduce Mark Evans. Mark Evans is a digital marketing and communications strategist. Uh, he has his own firm, ME Consulting. Um, he has worked in uh, marketing and content for startups and fast-growing companies for, for a long time. He's been involved in several startups, including Planet Eye, B5 Media, B5 Media and Sysimos. You've probably seen his writing. Uh, he, he has written for many years, as more than 10 years, as a technology reporter with the National Post, the Globe and Mail, and Bloomberg. He writes several blogs, including Mars Evans Tech, which I recommend you sign up for. It's, uh, it's always full of good stuff, and for Sysimos. And he writes a twice-weekly online column on small business and entrepreneurship for the Globe and Mail. He's also one of the founders of Mesh, which is Canada's leading web conference, which you'll, you'll probably mention. Um, and I'd, with that, I'd like to give a warm welcome to Mark. Thanks, Carrie. All right, uh, thanks, Carrie. Um, thank you for coming out on this day of days. So this is the third time that I've been asked to present a communications uh, presentation at Mars, and thanks for the invitation again. Uh, and every year it changes. The landscape changes, um, the technology changes. So the first year was all about social media when all of us were obsessed um, with all things Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube. Last year was a more holistic view, uh, looking at the entire sort of marketing landscape and the options that were available to um, startups. And this year, uh, I really want to focus on, on storytelling, because I think that that Storytelling lies at the foundation of what every company tries to do from a marketing, communications, and sales perspective. And this is particularly um, relevant and important for startups because you're, you have limited marketing resources and you're really scrambling to attract the spotlight. And how are you going to compete against the big companies, the, the, the companies that have much bigger marketing budgets? Well, it's, it's going to come down to big stories. And so what I want to do tonight is I want to um, put storytelling into historical uh, context and sort of and, and frame how stories are a really relevant part about how we communicate um, between friends, family, and people um, around the world. Secondly, I want to touch upon why entrepreneurs have such a hard time telling stories. Then we'll get into, so where do you start creating stories? You know, I mean, a lot of us aren't storytellers by, by nature. Um, so what are the steps we need to take to find what our story is? And then finally, I want to I talk about um, the different ways that we can tell our stories and the different channels and opportunities that, that are in front of us. So um, a little housekeeping. If you're on Twitter and you want to mention me, my username is, is uh, Mark Evans. And the presentation will be available, I think, in the next couple of days um, on the web. And there's a webcast as well. OK, so let's start um, with what I think is probably one of the most accurate uh, comments about storytelling. Um, and this is made by Gary Vaynerchuk. Anybody familiar with Gary Vaynerchuk? So Gary, um, his family owns a wine business in New Jersey, a very successful wine business. And about five or six years ago, uh, Gary decided that they really needed to get uh, into the digital world. They, they had a big physical store doing millions of dollars in sales, but they weren't doing anything digital, and Gary jumped on the bandwagon. Uh, he's the son of the owner, and this is obviously a place where he could sort of make his mark. Um, and Gary's an interesting guy because he is a typical New Jersey native. He's got the whole accent. He, he's a big fan of the New York Jets. Um, but he decided that the way that he was going to build his personal brand and to, and to drive um, his wine business's online brand was to, to basically storytell in, in his own distinct way. And Gary has gone on to become an author, a very, very well-known presenter, um, and, and really sort of made his mark as, as a classic storyteller. And I just want to show, show you a short video of, of Gary in action. And this is where he's talking about something that he calls wine bullies. And anybody who drinks wine, you'll, you'll relate to this. Hello, everybody. This is Gary Vayner Chuck from Wine Library TV. And I've got a little secret for you, a little fun thing that I think can make your wine drinking experience so much better. So many of you want to get into wine or the people that you do drink wine with are kind of holding you back. Not because they don't want you to drink wine, but because they're what I like to call wine bullies. We all have that person in our group or we go out to dinner that takes the wine list, that claims to know something. 
all they're really doing is reading a little bit more of the Wine Spectator than you are. So I'm going to show you a product, it's not very expensive, that is the great equalizer in creating a better atmosphere amongst that one wine bully in your group of friends that will change your wine drinking experience for the rest of your lives. Let me pull it out. The brown paper bag. At a very low price of free, if it's a nice store and they'll give it to you, you can take a brown paper bag and put wine in it and then pop it open and then pour it to your group of friends. You can do this at a party or at a dinner or a casual get together. Just make sure the bully is there. Get a couple of these and you'll find it's very interesting that when you take away preconceived notions or the prices on the wine list or the one or two wines that person really knows, how few people can tell the difference between a 1979 Chateau Margaux and a bottle of Yellowtail Shiraz? I think so, so anyway, I mean, this is Gary typical style, and he made he made weekly videos, and this became extremely popular, and it really catapulted him um, to digital stardom, and all about telling stories in a very, very unique way. He's not slick, he's not polished, um, he doesn't. It's very low production values, but it's really high in value as far as delivering information to um, his target audiences. So. I think the thing about storytelling, and I think the reason why it resonated with me, is that we're all storytellers in one way, shape, or form. Some of us are really good. Some of us can go to a party and we can captivate an audience and have them laughing whenever we want, and some of us not so good. But that's the way that we communicate with each other. And it's the way that sort of we tell stories about our professional lives and our personal lives. And, and I think that when you think about, from a marketing perspective, we're just translating what we do normally and putting that into our marketing programs. And so what I want to do is sort of go through some different ways that stories are delivered by different types of people to give you some perspective about where we've come from and where we're going. All right, so the, the, the original stories, when you think about storytelling, actually goes back to 15,000 to 13,000 BC uh, when, when cavemen were actually drawing pictures of humans and animals on cave walls. And these were discovered uh, in the 1940s by a, a group of French schoolchildren in the Pyrenees. And it really is the first sort of documented sign of storytelling. Um, and the fact that they were found thousands and thousands of years later um, attest to the fact that stories can be very enduring and eternal. Um, then you've got um, somebody like William Shakespeare. So, he wrote nearly 40 plays and tons of other sonnets and things like that. And 500 years later, nearly all of his plays are still being put on around the world. And it talks about the fact that, sure, Shakespeare made some pretty good plays, um, but that resonated with target audience, but they're eternal, right? They keep on going and going. And that's the thing about really good stories is that it's not, they have, it's, they have very long short, uh, shelf lives. Is that if you create something that's very creative or compelling or interesting, that'll stick around for a long time. And it's sort of words to think about when you're trying to embrace this whole movement called, called content marketing in the sense that you're not making it for a day, you're making it so it sticks around and it gets discovered and rediscovered and shared and things like that. Um, anybody have children in the audience? Anybody wish that there will come a time when you can stop reading them Cinderella, Snow White, Sleeping Beauty? Yeah, you know what I mean? Anyway, the Grimm brothers, um, basically created all these stories 300 years ago and we're still reading them to our kids. And Disney is still making a ton of money by making movies for our kids to watch over and over and over again. Um, but again, another example of, of really great stories that stick around. Eminem, he's a storyteller. Uh, he uses rap to deliver his stories. And if you think, if anybody has heard of the, of the, uh, the song Stan, and Stan is this fan who's, who's basically obsessed with Slim Shady, which is Eminem's alter ego and sort of the tragic ending that happens to Stan when he drives his car off a bridge. Um, and it's a story, it's a great story. And the video um, is a really good video that has drama, that it has sort of, it, it sets you up for the, for the grand finale and then it presents things with a surprise finish. Um, and then you've got Rick Mercer. So Rick Mercer is, a, is, a, is a, an amazing storyteller and, and the way that Rick has, has made his mark is with two minute Rants, in which he walks around the alleys of graffiti-filled uh, places in Toronto and talks about the things that bugs him. So for a minute and a half, a minute and 45 seconds, he tells you a great story. And in the process, by, by embracing storytelling, he's become one of our, our leading political commentators. Um, and then you've got Ron Popeil. Anybody know who Ron Popeil is? You know, the pocket fisherman, Ronco, that kind of thing. So 
I would suggest that, that Ron is probably one of the greatest marketers of the 21st century. And the fact that he has used a particular medium, which is infomercials, to tell us a story. Now, I know there's probably a lot of people who have been watching late night TV and you're flicking the channels and you come to the, the infomercial for Ronco, whatever he's selling, you know, the, the turkey, the chicken maker, that kind of thing. And how many minutes do you watch? It's not like one, not two, it's probably about 15. Because it's such, there's such good stories that you want to see what happens. What happens next? Is he going to offer me a good deal? Will I get a set of Ginsu knives thrown in with that deal? You keep on watching. And so, you know, Ron is a storyteller in a particular way. And here's just an example of Ron in action. For all the work it does, this machine should sell for over $400. You know you're not going to spend $400 for it, not $375 or $350, not $325 or even $300, not $275 or $250, not $225 or even $200 like you all may be thinking, not $190 or even $180. All you spend for this fabulous machine, an over $400 value, all you spend is just four easy monthly payments of $39.95. And look what you get. So he had you, right? You were waiting. When's it going to stop? How long is it going to go? What am I going to get? It's a classic story. He, 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 he strings you along, strings you along, makes you go to the end, and then the grand finale, right? So there's an example of, of how Storytelling can be told in different ways and done in different ways. And then finally, what I, what I consider the, the ultimate storyteller um, of our generation is Steve Jobs. And the way that, sure, he was a visionary and he was a design guru and all the great things that, that Jobs did to transform Apple into what it is today, but really he was a storyteller. And you think about all the times that he got on stage and the excitement that he built up for his products and the way that he delivered that excitement um, in ways that are really impossible probably to, to, uh, to match. Um, and it really sort of epitomizes the fact that he was an amazing storyteller. And here's a, here is a video of, of Steve um, introducing what has become a pretty ubiquitous device. Well, today we're introducing three revolutionary products of this class. The first one is a widescreen iPod with touch controls. The second is a revolutionary mobile phone. And the third is a breakthrough internet communications device. So, three things. A widescreen iPod with touch controls, a revolutionary mobile phone, and a breakthrough internet communications device. An iPod, a phone, and an internet communicator, an iPod, a phone. Are you getting it? These are not three separate devices. This is one device. And we are calling it iPhone. All right, so the thing about that is you knew the ending already. You knew it was coming. And everybody in the audience probably knew it was coming. But he had you, right? He was telling the story. It had drama. It had pacing. You, didn't, you wanted to know what, was gonna, what he was going to say next. And again, right, it's classic storytelling. So the, the thing about storytelling is, so why do they work so well? Why, do they, why are they so powerful? Why are they so effective? And the first thing is they're memorable. You know, whether it's Ron Peel or Steve Jobs or the Grimm Brothers or Shakespeare or the person who told you a really great story about their weekend um, in the cafeteria, is that if they're really good stories, you remember them for a long, long time. Um, and they're motivational. Um, they get you excited. I mean, I mean, whether he's trying to sell an iPhone or Ron Peel is trying to sell us a pocket fisherman um, or the Grimm Brothers or, or the Disney's trying to sell us Grimm Brother movies, 
Um, they get you to do stuff. They, they're very compelling that make you to want to get up and do something right now. And now they're really shareable, whereas before, you know, the, the stories would pass along from generation to generation, um, and that's the way that we shared our stories and, and, and enriched our culture. And today, using tools such as social media, I mean, they're instantly shareable, and that's why videos can go viral like that. Um, and these are the sort of the three traits that make storytelling um, such a powerful medium. Okay, so what does storytelling have to do with startups? Um, it's a classic question because startups are in the business of producing products and attracting customers um, and, and trying to become viable businesses. And the answer to that is that it's, it's um, everything. Storytelling for a startup is everything. It how, it's how you establish yourself. It's how you build your business. It's how you gain momentum. Um, and if without a good story, you're, you're dead because there are dozens and dozens of companies that are doing the exact same thing as you with technology that is just as good, that has just as many bells as whistles, and the only difference between you and them is that they probably have better stories. So, the thing is that most startups are really bad storytellers. And I think you can talk about sales execution and marketing execution and hiring the wrong people or not getting enough money, but at the end of the day, if you have bad stories, it's not gonna work because there's just too much competition out there. There's too many people telling other stories. So for a startup, you have to have great stories. It's just, it's a no-brainer. It really is do or die, and I hate to be very dramatic about it. Um, but there's bad stories tellers for a variety of reasons, and here's the big three. The first is that they have no perspective. So whether you're working on a project or a startup or anything that takes all your time is that you're very focused. You're drinking the Kool-Aid 24-7. It's all you do. It's all you think about. It's all you talk about. It's all you want to do when you get up in the morning. And so you can't see the bigger picture. You can't look at, at the outside. It's very hard for you to look from the outside looking in and to get a sense of, of whether your product resonates, whether it's interesting to any of your target audience, whether you're you're going to be building something that somebody else has already built. So this lack of perspective, being also known as being close to the fire, is a killer uh, for storytelling because you don't know what you should be talking to your customers about. You're basically talking, only thinking about what your product does right now. Um, the second one is most uh, startups talk about product, not about what consumers need. And this is huge. And it's, it's looking at the lens in a slightly different way because you think that they're the same thing, but they're not. So if you look at the websites of most startups, it's all about their features. It's all about um, sort of the technical um, aspects of their product. Faster, better, more productive, more efficient, uh, free, not so free, freemium, all those things that have nothing to do with what the consumer wants. It, it has everything to do with what the startup is selling. Uh, and that's a, that's, a, that's a big, big mistake because then you're talking at them, you're not talking to them and you're not talking to them about the things that are most relevant to them and most needed by them and most interested for them. Um, and that's, and that's, that's a hard thing to do. Uh, and third, it's the wrong tool set. So most startups, uh, they're great engineers, they're great programmers. Maybe they're, maybe they're really seasoned business managers, but they're not storytellers and they're not marketers. And, and the thing that I found time and time again and the thing that frustrates me most about entrepreneurs when it comes to marketing is that it's really hard for them to get um, another perspective, to embrace skills that are not their own. Uh, because storytelling is a very different type of activity. It's somewhat objective, uh, somewhat subjective. Uh, sometimes the stories make sense. Sometimes the stories are completely out there because you're trying to be creative. But for a lot of entrepreneurs, particularly technical entrepreneurs, um, storytelling is really far from their skill set. And the, and the key is for them to recognize what they're good at and what they're not good at and, and if they're not good storytellers, then they need someone to help them, um, whether it's somebody full-time or on contract or freelance or, or their friends who can basically steer them in the right direction. Okay, so how do you start telling stories? That's the, one of the biggest hurdles facing a lot of companies because, yeah, we want to tell great stories, and yes, we want to beat the competition, and, and yes, we want to attract the spotlight, but how do you do it? So. Really, I think the storytelling for a lot of entrepreneurs starts right from the beginning. You really have to sort of Think about what your stories are even as you're developing your product, even before you get to market, even before your product just begins to take shape because ultimately the story can't be sort of grabbed out of thin air one day. You can't say, okay, we're ready to tell a story to match our product. It's really, you've really got a thinking story right, right away. 
And the other thing, it's got to be built into your corporate DNA. Everybody within your company needs to be thinking about what is the story that I need to tell about the company that I work for, the company that I invest in, the company that I own, uh, the company that my friends work at. So it's just got to be baked in completely so that we're, we all become corporate storytellers in one way, shape, or form. Some of us are on the public stage, and some of us simply talk to our friends and family, but we're all talking about the same kind of story to different target audiences. And so the obvious question is, how come? Well, there's lots of different reasons for that, and here are four. One is that when you're doing a startup or you're starting your own business, is that the first thing you do is you've got to convince your friends and family. So whether you've just left school or whether you've left a really stable job with great benefits and you decided to do the startup thing, is that most of your friends and family are going to tell you you're crazy. You know, been there, done that, right? So you've got to have a great story to tell them saying, this, this is not a crazy idea. This is not something that came out of left field. I've actually got real reasons why I want to do this. So what you're doing is you're telling a story. So you're telling your wife, you're telling your girlfriend, you're telling your boyfriend, but basically you're trying to convince them that you're on the right path and a good story is the best way to do that. Uh, you want to attract employees. So employees have lots of choices. They could work for this little tiny high risk um, company that has a really good idea or they could go work for a big company that has you know, stable benefits, a free, you know, free cafeteria um, and, and job security. Well, if you don't have a good story, you're not going to get those type of people, especially the best people. So again, you're telling stories to the people that you want to work for you. Customers, obvious, right? But when we're talking to customers, so customers respond to stories. And they respond to stories in different ways. And it could be a 60-second um, ad during the Super Bowl, or it could be a tweet, or it could be a case study, or it could be a white paper. But they're all stories. And it's the way that you engage customers, the way that you pull them into your world and begin to tell them about the product and your benefits and all the good things that you can do for them. And finally, raising capital. You know, you think about VCs and you think about how many startups approach VCs? How many entrepreneurs are, are grabbing a VC during a conference or sending them email or t calling them on the phone? And the dozens and dozens and dozens of stories that they must hear and, the, t and the, the amount of times that they have to say no. Now, a good story may not get you investment, but a good story may get you in the door. It may actually get a second meeting or get you another 15 seconds um, or get you to, for them to, to refer you to somebody else. But without a good story, you're never going to get their attention. You're never going to resonate with them. You're not going to make an impact at all. So the question is, and the thing you got to do, is decide what's your story. At the end of the day, what, is, what does it really boil down to? Um, who are you? What do you do? And why should I care are the three big questions. And so what you do is you start with what do you do? Simple question. Should be easy to answer, but it's not. So when I was a reporter at the National Post and the Globe and Mail, and I would get uh, emails and telephone calls from PR companies really asking me to talk to one of their clients. And I was a nice reporter, and I would say, sure, OK, I'll talk to them. And so you'd arrange the telephone interview, and, and they'd launch into their spiel. And they'd talk for about five minutes, and they'd go on and on. And I would say, OK, uh, I've been doing this for about 10 years. I understand the vernacular. I understand all the acronyms. I've gotten pretty savvy when it comes to technology. And I have no idea what you did, what you do. I had no clue. They talked about enterprise, they talked about solutions, you know, all the sort of buzzwords. And it wasn't English. I had no, no idea of what they do. And so I'd say to you, OK, listen, explain to me in layman's terms, like stuff that my mom could understand what you do. And then you go, well, we make widgets to make cars go faster. And I'd say, well, how come you didn't say that in the first place? And that's what we're talking about when you think about what you do and, and really boiling down that message to something that could resonate with, with your girlfriend or your grandmother or your cousin or a stranger that you met at a party, where immediately they get what you do. They go, OK, I got it, right? And then you can tell them more or not, depending on whether they're interested in what you have to say. But essentially, what you do is, is the biggest thing that you have to start with. If you can nail that, then you're on your way. Second is who needs it, really identifying who your target audiences are. Um, you know, truth be told, not everyone's going to need your product. So you have to figure out who are those people, what's their buying behavior, what motivates them, um, what are they looking to do. You know, one of the things that I um, do when I'm trying to think about target audiences is personas, creating individual personas for all the different people that you want to reach. There may be like four different types of people, and I give the personas a name. So this one is Betty, and this one is Joe, 
And then I say, well, how old are they? What's their job? Um, what are they looking to do? And how can they be made to look like a hero? Because we're all trying to do well. We're all trying to get paid more or get more vacation or get a promotion. We're all trying to impress our boss so that they'll recognize us um, as employee of the month. And so what you've got to think about with these personas and your target audience is how do you make them look good? How does your product make them look good? And that's important to think about. Uh, what are the key benefits? You know, so how does your product help them? How does it make them more profitable, more efficient? How does it save them time? How does it help them drive more relationships, more leads, more sales? So the benefits for them, not the features that you want to tell them about, but the benefits for them, what they get. And then how are you unique from your rivals? So again, as I said, right, there's, you may think you have the greatest idea in the world, but there are dozens and dozens of companies out there that have the exact same idea. And their brands are cooler and their spokespeople are probably you know, more slick and they've got more media. But you've got to figure out how you're going to outflank them. Like how do you differentiate yourselves from all those competitors out there? And that's an important part of your story because it really has to, has to do with how do you make your story rise above the pack and have a unique slant. And then, well, with them, which is basically what's in it for me. So I come to a company's website or I read their marketing material and I, I don't care about you. I don't care what you do. I don't care what your product. All I care about is what do I get at the end of the day. I don't care what your logo looks like or whether you're free or whether you're paid. All I care about is I need, I need help doing something. And if you can help me do that, that's great. So you need to serve my needs. And this should be a tenant for everything you do when you're thinking about marketing. How can you meet the needs of your target audiences in a way that is relevant to what they want to do, not what you want to sell? OK. So uh, talk about content. So this is sort of the um, way that we deliver our stories and we create our stories and we get our stories consumed by different um, target audiences. And so for a lot of us, there's, there's tons of different channels out there. I mean, there's, and then we'll go through them. And there's, but there's no lack of options in terms of the, of the places where you can tell your stories. And so for entrepreneurs and startups, it really comes down to having a great story, Aligning that great story with where your target audiences are consuming your story. So it's no use to be telling your story on Facebook if none of your target audiences are on Facebook. Um, uh, what your budget is, so how many people do you actually have to create stories, uh, and what you think your ROI is going to be. And making sure that all of those are aligned so that sto the stories you tell resonate with the right audiences and get the reaction that you want, whether it's more leads, more sales, brand awareness, all that kind of thing. So we start with website, which I think is probably, the, is probably the most important thing that you have online. It's your digital hub. It's the places where people will go to. So we all talk about social media being really important these days. And the one thing to realize with social media is that you don't own your social media presences. You, you rent your space on Facebook, Twitter, um, LinkedIn, YouTube. It's all leased property. And your website is what you own. So your website better do an amazing job. It better tell people right away what you do and why they should care. So there's a study at the, um, at the University of Missouri that, say that had said that um, first impressions for a website are 0.5 seconds. And people decide whether they want to stay or not in two seconds. Think about that. Think about what that means to your content, to your design, to your messaging, to the whole story that you're telling uh, consumers when they arrive at your website. So you think about sort of websites that sort of stick out. So this is for um, Squared, which is um, kind of a, a website service. Essentially, it's clear. They have a very simple story right from the get-go. I mean, it's just their messaging right from the beginning, but messaging is, is, is storytelling. Uh, people, do, anybody use Evernote? Probably a lot of Evernote <laughs> users, right? So essentially, remember everything. It's a great story. I mean, it's a story that resonates right away. OK, that sounds good to me. And essentially, what they're doing is the benefits, right, for the users. Not the features that you can, you can you know, annotate notes and you can bookmark stuff. It's basically all the things that you want to do, the user wants to do. Mint, which is all about personal finance, so it's easy to understand what's going on with your money, right? Very simple story, very easy to get. And then we have things like white papers. Anybody downloaded a HubSpot white paper? No? Yes? You should. They're free and they're really good. And all they ask you is for your email address, and they bug you for the next month or so. But that's the price for getting free content. But it's great content. It's really great content. And so what HubSpot has really done um, with these eBooks is that they've 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 embraced um, the idea of of content that's that's easily distributable, 
that is valuable, that is relevant, um, and then they tie that into their marketing machine. So you get great content that, they, that they've created. You get to benefit from the great content. Hopefully they build their brand, they build their marketing presence, they get more leads, they get more sales. Um, blogs, you know, blogs may not be sexy anymore. Um, we may not sort of talk about blogs the way that we used to, um, but I, feel, I still think that blogs are the digital workhorses out there. They're the, 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 the vehicles that allow you to um, display thought leadership, um, domain expertise, information about your product and your services in a very fluid and dynamic and interactive way. And so I always tell startups that if you want to beef up your online presence, you want to establish your domain expertise, you want to be seen as a thought leader, then you should blog. And it can, doesn't have to be five times a week, it can be once a week as long as what you're doing has some kind of value to your target audiences. As long as it's not all about you and how great you are, but actually has some insight or some, some inspiration or some ideas that people can embrace. And you sort of think about you know, two brands with great blogs is Mint. Obviously Mint is doing a lot of things right. They obviously did a lot of things right because they got by, bought by Intuit for $170 million. And then there's, uh, there's an app called Buffer App. Anybody use Buffer App? It's a great way of, of um, slotting your tweets throughout the day. Should check it out. And but they've, what they've really done—a really tiny startup. What they've really done is they've done an amazing job with content, and they have they have an awesome blog that is not about their app at all. It's all about using social media, um, best practices, that kind of thing. Um, and then you've got you, videos. So I'm writing a blog post tomorrow about nine tips um, to make great videos. So you can watch this and then you can read the blog post tomorrow. And I, I, I think that videos are probably the most powerful uh, marketing tool you probably have out there. For startups, it's, it's probably the most cost-effective marketing tool that you can, you can get out there. You can make videos from anywhere from like 50 bucks if you want to make them yourself to $10,000 if you've got a huge budget. Um, but it's great content. It's compelling content. People, it can be engaging. It can be entertaining. It can be educational. Um, and it's great for SEO. Google loves because loves uh, content. So I'll show you a video. Um, you may have already seen it. Uh, this is a classic story of, of a, a startup that came out of nowhere, um, created a really awesome story, and subsequently raised a million dollars because just simply because of, of their awesome story, on the back of their awesome story. And the, the video went viral, which probably helped their, their investment uh, activities. Hi, I'm Mike, founder of dollarshaveclub.com. What is dollarshaveclub.com? Well, for a dollar a month, we send high quality razors right to your door. Yeah, a dollar. Are the blades any good? No. Our blades are f***ing great. Each razor has stainless steel blades and aloe vera lubricating strip and a pivot head. It's so gentle a toddler could use it. And do you like spending $20 a month on brand name razors? 19 go to Roger Federer. I'm good at tennis. And do you think your razor needs a vibrating handle, a flashlight, a back scratcher, and 10 blades? Your handsome ass grandfather had one blade and polio. Looking good, pop up. Stop paying for shave tech you don't need. And stop forgetting to buy your blades every month. Alejandro and I are gonna ship them right to you. We're not just selling razors, we're also making new jobs. Alejandro, what were you doing last month? Not working. What are you doing now? Working. I'm no Vanderbilt, but this train makes hay. So stop forgetting to buy your blades every month and start deciding where you're going to stack all those dollar bills I'm saving you. We are dollarshaveclub.com and the party is on. So it's a great story. You know, done in a very creative way. A very, very low budget. The thing went viral. It got millions of views on YouTube. They raised a million dollars. Now they're doing business in Canada. So if you want to order from dollarshaveclub.com, you can. Um, but, but that's called creative storytelling. Um, and this was, a, this was a way that the company was allowed uh, to rise above the crowd. It's, it's all in the back of a great story, delivered in a really funny and creative way. So just want to leave you with um, some food for thought, four points. One is think stories, not products. Um, you may have a great product. You may have all the bells and whistles in the world. It may be exactly what people need, but if you talk about your product and how wonderful it is, it's not, those aren't good stories. That's just product blabble. You know what I mean? It's just, 
I don't care, right? But what I want to know is a good story that resonates with me, a story that talks about my needs and my interests. Um, and if you can do that, then eventually I'll get around to learning more about your product. But that'll happen later. First, bring me into the house, and then you can start selling me from there. Um, second, put yourself in the other person's shoes. Uh, so don't think about yourself and your needs and your desires to attract more customers and more sales. Think about what is the potential customer thinking? What's your existing customer thinking when, when you're talking to them through marketing? Um, what are they looking for you to do? What kind of information do they need? Um, how, do you, how do they want to be inspired or excited um, enough that they'll fill out a form, they'll buy something, they'll download something? Whatever it takes, uh, think about what they want and how, how you would want to be treated if you were in their shoes. And party where the party's happening, which is to say that there are tons of different options out there that you can consider. You can certainly get blogs done and white papers and videos and Facebook pages and Twitter, but it doesn't really make sense if that's not where your target audiences are, are hanging out. Um, so for example, you know, I was talking to a potential client yesterday um, who's been banging his head on Twitter. You know, he, he sells software to charities and he's been trying to, real, trying to figure out why he's not getting any traction. And it may not be, they, they just don't go there. And what they may want in return is a really good blog that tells them how to run their charities more efficiently um, and how to maybe save time when they're trying to fundraise. So the thing to think about is, again, putting yourself in their shoes is, is where do they go to get information about buying products? If they're not on Facebook, don't be on Facebook. And that's really part of the storytelling process is to figure out where to tell those stories. Because um, you can have great stories, but if you tell them in the wrong places, they're not going to work very well. Um, and finally, be different, unique, or both. You know, we're all unique in our own way. I mean, you think about how we try to behave as individuals, and we all try to carve out a unique identity. We dress differently. We act differently. We talk differently. Uh, we eat different foods. And the same thing works for, for companies, uh, especially startups. You really have to stand up from the crowd. You really have to think about, so at the end of the day, how am I unique? How am I different from everybody else? And it may be the fact that that your startup was, was created by two women. It may be the fact that it's 18-year-old students in their basement. It may be the fact that you're 65 and you're retired and you stumbled upon a really good idea because you picked something up as a hobby. Um, it may be that you immigrated from Afghanistan and suddenly landed on your feet with a great new business. Whatever it is, there's something in all of you that's unique or different. And we just have to find it. And once you find that and you start building a story around it, then you're good to go. OK, so last words. Um, from, um, from Ken Kensey, who wrote uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. It really is. At the end of the day, you know, the facts are the facts, but if you can tell me a great story, then, then you've got me. So um, I'm available for questions. There may be questions from the webcast. There may be questions in the audience. So if you have any, I'm, I'll be uh, happy to answer them now, and I'll, I'll stick around later if you're, if you're the shy type and want to grab me afterwards. Great. Thank you. Hiya. When uh, you're putting together the, uh, the business end of things when you're starting up, like a, an executive summary or slide deck or something like this, right. how much of your story should you tell? Because, you know, it's about the fat figures as well. Right. Uh, well, uh, uh, investor decks um, are all uh, business plans or stories, different types of stories. Um, so they have to include the usual elements, the numbers and the graph charts that you're going to grow this much in that many years. But essentially, you're, you're, your target audience is a particular type of person. And you've got to figure out, so what kind of story do they want to hear? Now, that story could include lots of stats and spreadsheets. Um, but in a sense, it's a different type of story for a different type of audience. Okay. So it's really, it really boils down to what your core story is, and then taking that core and then playing it in different channels. Okay, thanks. I'm wondering if you could comment on the relationship between sales and marketing, when marketing supports sales, and when interests between sales and marketing might be competing interests, and how to address those. Uh, I, well, I don't, I don't think that uh, I, don't, I think sales and marketing should be should be um, basically sort of the two-headed beast, because I think that that the stories that marketers tell and the stories that salespeople tell um, are variations on a theme. And what's interesting is that when you're a sales guy and you're out in the field and you're trying to pitch a story and, and parts of your story resonate and parts of them don't, then your, your marketing people need to know that. That's the only way that they're going to actually create more effective stories if they actually have real world information about what's going on out there. Um, so I, I don't see them competing at all um, in, a, in, a, in a, 
ideal situation, they're actually feeding each other information. So it's actually a two-way street. And the same can be said for product development, too, because if your product people don't know what your marketers are thinking or what your sales people are hearing, then there's no way that you can actually come up with something that actually connects with target audiences. Uh, many years ago, Air Canada introduced a business class service. I think it was called Attaché at the time. And what ended up happening is they're pro promising all the business people that they'd have a closet to hang up their coats. And marketing was, was you know, telling this, but the airplanes didn't have the closets right. yet. And so there was a disconnect between the product and what the marketing was saying. And I'm talking about those kind of sometimes the disconnects between sales and marketing and how one may lag the other. And, and the rules for each other? Well, I, I think at the end of the day, they, they all have to um, sort of be at the table. You know, it's, I, I don't think any, any part of your business can, be in, can operate in isolation. So it, it used to be not that long ago that social media was over here, and then your marketing and sales and product people were over here because social media was just sort of doing your tweets and Facebook updates. But they're, they're the people that are actually engaging with customers in the real world, and they have, they have things to bring to the table. So it, it's, I think if, if they're all sort of aligned, they have to be aligned. That's the only way it's actually going to happen. Sure. Hi, Mark. Um, I've actually got two questions for you. So the first has to do with content and uh, creating that message that you've talked so well about. Um, so there's a school of thought on the, on the lean side of startups that you, like in the digital space at least, um, you have a number of chances to, to iterate what your message is going to be. So rather than go directly to an agency or some a professional organization right at first, you do a little experimentation on, on your own. Just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Sure. Um, so do-it-yourself um, messaging, I think, or storytelling is, I think, it's great. Um, you know, one of the exercises that that you do is you sit sit around for a couple hours, and it could be pizza, it could be beer, whatever you, whatever fuels you, and you brainstorm. You get a whiteboard and you write down all the things about your target audiences, all the things about your product, and and it's, what eventually happens is is themes pop up, keywords start to resonate with you about the things that make you unique or different, or the things that you've heard from people. Um, so I, I think you know taking a hack at storytelling, at creating your core message um, is a really good exercise. And then you can bring somebody in, and it doesn't have to be on a full-time basis. Um, it can be, you could bring somebody on, on a contract basis, or you could take the next step and, and bring all your mothers into, into your room and tell them the story and see if they get it. And then you can iterate from there. But there's no reason why you have to hire a PR agency to, or a digital agency to, to start storytelling. Thank you. Uh, so my second question has to do with um, apps. So. You were talking about websites, and um, you listed off some really, uh, really notable ones like Evernote, and um, so they, they've done clearly done a really great job. How do you feel about apps in the marketing space today? Given that apps may, may not necessarily be core for delivering your message, but you may not be found. Um, so, how do you feel about that as a marketing tool, just being in the app world? Uh, well. I mean, so apps have less real estate to actually sell their products, so you've really got to be really, really good at storytelling. Uh, but it's not to say that, so they may not visit your website, um, they may just visit you in the, in the app store, but then you've got to tell your stories in other places, um, whether it's blogs or websites or traditional media. I mean, every company needs a good story to tell, and that story can be in niche much space on the app store or it can be in a, in a newspaper, but, but it really is um, aligning your story with the places you're going to tell it. Um, so I, I don't think apps are any different from any other type of company. Okay, thank you. Hi, Mark. Hey. I'm Andy Shaw, and I'm a journalist and a consultant like you are. Um, in my particular uh, niche is I help uh, small, medium-sized companies tell their stories at trade shows. And one of the stories that I tell them is about a broadcaster here in Toronto years ago called Gordon Sinclair. Right. And some of you may remember him. And Gordon said there are only four things that people are really interested in in a story. And I'd like to get your comment on them. He said, conquest, disaster, sex, and money. <laughs> well, first, welcome to the dark side. Those of us who have left the world of journalism to, to the uh, other side. Um, yeah, so it's, it, it's actually a great, it's a great uh, comment, and thank you for that. So, so you think about what attracts the attention of journalists or bloggers or is basically uh, stuff that sits on extremes. So it's stuff that's really exciting and that's stuff that's really terrifying. And all the stuff in the middle, the kind of stuff that you kind of go, man, it's kind of interesting. You can't just be interest, kind of interesting. You have to be different or unique. It has to be something that, about you and about the story that you tell that is somewhat compelling in some way. That if you're, 
um, if you're just in the, in the mushy middle, it, it won't work because there's a lot of companies that are sort of in the same space. So you've got to figure out how do I get to the, some, the extremes in some way? How do I get somebody to, to sort of poke their head up and go, hey, these guys are interesting for whatever reason. Some, hopefully it's all the good things, but sometimes it's all the bad things, right? So for example, a really good example of, of a good story is when a company pivots. So they go down one line of business and their business is a disaster and then they pivot into something new and they rebound in a new direction. Well, you're gonna tell a bad news story about how you blew $2 million in VC money and how your original product vision was way off the mark. And that's a bad news story, but, but really bad news actually is, can be good news from a marketing perspective if you, if you tell it in the right way. Go ahead. Hi. Um, the question of, of stories. Um, on the one hand, there's the story of the, the person who has the company on the other hand, there's a question of the target customer. Um, in your experience, are those two different stories, one directed to venture capitalists, a different one directed to customers, or ideally does one aim to have a story that synthesizes both of those two perspectives? Um, so the stories about founders, they, they can be interesting if there's something interesting about the founders, if there's something different or novel that would help the startup uh, or the small business rise above the crowd. I mean, you're always looking to leverage something to make that happen. So if you've got a good story to tell about your founders, then, then tell them. Um, most investors probably aren't looking for a great story about, about the founders. They're looking for just information about who they are and whether they've got the goods. Um, so my tendency is that it, the story is mostly about the product uh, and that how it meets the needs of target audiences. That's where I, and then the, the founders usually is a supporting actor because you can be really smart, but if, you're, if your product doesn't sell, it doesn't really matter. Okay, sorry. Uh, somewhat technical question, perhaps. Um, the stories you've been talking about are mostly statements of fact. Now, unless you're a postmodernist, um, stories that get people have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Right. They take somebody on a journey, and they're different at the end of it. How do you make that st list of facts fit the, the more compelling structure of the, of the real story? Right. Well, that's, that's a good question because what you're trying to do is you're trying to, it's not a one-size-fits-all proposition in terms of you know, the classic storytelling uh, process. So Steve Jobs follows that, that process to a T. He, he sets you up, creates the drama, and then has the, has the happy ending. Um, same with Ron Popeil. Uh, for startups, in a sense, you're, you're trying to do that. Um, you're trying to sort of say, this is the problem that you have, right? And wouldn't it be great if there was a solution to that? And here's the solution. So in a, in a sense, they're following the same formula, but they're doing it in a different way to fit the medium. Um, so you know, for, for startup demo videos, for example, they, they all follow the same formula. You know, problem, wouldn't it be great? And then the solution. Um, so you're right in the sense that they don't exactly always fit, um, but you, you, you want to have a little bit of drama. You want to have a, a, bit of a, a bit of a reveal and then make customers happy at the end of the day. Good segue with Steve Jobs. The other half of the story with Steve is a fellow who founded IDEO, who was the designer behind a lot of the stuff that made Apple stuff cool. Mm -hmm. And how a lot of those designs came to be were getting different people from totally different uh, professions and what have you together to brainstorm. I thought, well, that's for creating the product. What about getting different people from a, a, a techie, a lawyer, a, a social activist, whatever, into a room to produce the story? Have you heard of somebody actually doing that successfully? Uh, I haven't heard of anybody doing that successfully, but I, I worked for a, um, a startup in Stratford, uh, and we created this really great story. And then we went out to, to uh, one of their customers, at, at potential customers at Cisco, and said, so here's our story, what do you think? And they went, I don't get it. And so they said, you, this is the story that you should tell. And, and, and it was actually a really valuable lesson in the sense that you, sh you actually have to talk to people when you're creating your stories to test them to see if they work. Because the story that you think, and even, you know, I think that my, my, I'm pretty good at storytelling, even the stories that you create, sometimes they don't work at all because you really haven't told them or tested them with, with the audiences that you want to reach. Um, so that is sort of in market research, whether it's formal or informal, um, tends to be a great way to, to figure out whether your stories are actually any good or not. Sorry. Oh, all right. Uh, 
question about, I would say in a way, target market, target, uh, targeting my story to my uh, audience. Now, if I am looking at any kind of a solution, say a digital solution, et cetera, I'm looking at a, a target audience which is all the way from, say, teenagers to uh, baby boomers. And each one of that generation is kind of responding to a different language structure. They're connecting to a different emotion. They're connecting to a different source as well. Um, what do you think is the best way to, for a company to position itself? Should we actually take a side of what kind of a generation we want to uh, align ourselves towards? Or should I just kind of you know, uh, say or try to appeal to a particular generation with, uh, with a different tone and then turn around and completely change my tone to be able to attract the other one? Oh, that, when you, when you have a broad audience like that, it's a huge marketing challenge. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I guess the, the simple answer would be that you have to create sort of umbrella messaging, uh, messaging that actually appeals um, to whatever audiences you want to reach in a very sort of wide way. And then the way that you would reach them, the way that you, the, the channels that you would use to deliver that story mm -hmm. would be slightly different. So if you were trying to um, reach um, teenagers, you might, create a video that had, that appealed to them and their sensibilities and their sense of taste. Mm -hmm. Where if you were trying to reach um, baby boomers, it might be, it might be an ebook or a, or a white paper. The same kind of, same core story, but different, like a variation on a theme. So like a starting point is really having a, a, a really solid core story about your product. And then you figure out in creative ways how to tell that story in different, to different audiences. Thanks. Okay. Hi, Mark. Um, great presentation. It's been really useful. So just a quick question about um, once we've got a blog going, once we've got some marketing material out there, how can we get, how can we get notice? Like that's what we're struggling with right now is we've got great content on our blog, but we want people reading it. So what would you advise for us? Keep going. <laughs> so, uh, so what happens with, with uh, like we're all in, the, in sort of in the world of instant gratification and we want to be discovered immediately. But one thing for any marketing efforts, whether you're, you've got a small budget or a large budget, you've got to keep on going. You've got to keep on pounding away. Um, second is that you've got to think of creative ways or um, to reach audiences in different ways to, to capture their attention. Or sometimes it's just grunt work. You know, if, if it's a blog, for example, and, and you're not getting the audience that you want, so maybe you just got to identify the top 100 bloggers um, who are in your space and start commenting on on their blogs, or maybe 100 is too many, but let's say it's 25, and you start commenting on their blogs on a regular basis. Um, and all of a sudden, you become part of that, that bigger community. Um, and then you've got to continually look for what the, the different angles are that, 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 you, can, um, that you can latch onto. So, so David Merman Scott um, talked about um, newsjacking. So whatever your product is, if you see a news story happening, you've got to figure out how can we position ourselves to be part of that story. So it's not, the story's not about you, the story's about the bigger picture, but you're an integral part of it. So you're trying to be opportunistic. Um, and so you're always looking at, for different ways to tell your story. So you gotta be, always, you gotta be on the lookout um, for those kind of situations. Thanks. Hey, thanks. Yeah, I'm, I think your presentation is great, and I do believe that you should stay closer to telling a story, storytelling, literature, and all that, not as a source of, as a source of inspiration, not only of that, but like a code for being an entrepreneur. But on that part, my question was how to know if your story is getting like too long, how to have this sense of sanity about the length of a story. Because what I face the problem is sometimes is um, people get the feeling that it's too long a story, that's uh, something too long. How to know the length, like how to satisfy the length of a story, it's something that's right for people to listen, and it also says all what you have to say. How right. To... Well, there's, there's, so there's two schools of thought for that. One is that, that every medium has, has, the, has the sweet spot when it comes to length. So a video, for example, like a, should be at most not more than 90 seconds, because after that, like the drop-off rate, like you get to 30 seconds, and the drop-off rate goes higher and higher the longer it is. Okay, so that's, so that's pretty basic. A blog post shouldn't be anywhere probably between 250 and 500 words. If you read a thousand word blog post, it can be fantastic. Um, but it, people aren't gonna read it. They don't have the time, right? So it all depends what the, what the, the channel is. And the second one, um, which I think is also really important, is that what you're doing when, you, when you're telling a story is you're, you're really sort of presenting an onion. Think about it. And that people peel back the onion. 
layer by layer. So if the first part of the story is really interesting, then they'll peel back the second part of the story. And then they'll peel back the third part and the fourth part. And before you know it, they've read a lot of your story. But you haven't tried to jam it down their throats right away. You've actually tried to do it in a very sort of nuanced way. So they're taking small bites. And at the end of the day, they've had a big meal. They just don't know it. Um, so don't try to sort of present everything right away. Try to have a little, you know, try to be a little, a little sly, a little diplomatic, that what kind of way. Um, and then eventually, if, you, if the story, if chapter one is really interesting, chapter two is really interesting, chapter three, then they'll read the whole book. That's sort of a simple way to go about it. Great, thanks. Yeah. Hi there. Um, my background's communication, so, and I came here to learn more about business, so it's really interesting hearing you talk about storytelling. And I just wanted to reinforce with um, that, I don't know if you've read Daniel H. Pink, A Whole New Mind. Right. He talks about creativity and how more and more companies are, are calling MFAs in instead of MBAs. And I thought about what this gentleman said about how getting different people into the think tank people from all different experiences. And he talks about creativity and storytelling is exactly what makes one company stand out from another. But right. I just, so I just want to say thank you, but I wanted to add that because it, it reinforces everything you were saying. Yeah, great point, really good point. And I think what, you'll, what you're finding if you look at, uh, at social media, for example, so, so um, a few years ago it was pretty novel and if, if you were doing social media you could get a lot of traction and then it became table stakes. Everybody was doing social media and the latest wave right now is content marketing. Anybody here embracing content marketing, thinking about content marketing? So it's great right now and then what you're going to see in 2013 is that a lot of brands are going to embrace content marketing and then they're all going to, the, the idea that we all have to become publishers and so everybody's going to be producing lots of content and it's going to be table stakes because everybody's going to be doing it and you know what's going to to help you is going to be great stories that you tell. So everyone's going to have content, but the best stories, the best content will win. Because it won't, just because you're doing it, it won't be unique anymore. It won't give you that competitive edge. So again, it all goes back to storytelling and creativity. So those are two great points. Mark, I'm going to take um, our final question from the webcast. Can you give us a real life example and tell us your story in 60 seconds? My story? Oh, geez. Uh, well, I can tell you that, I, I can tell you that, um, I, I, maybe the, the, the thing is that the storytelling and iterations of stories and, and crafting your story, it actually never ends. So there's no, it doesn't, um, there's no point where you, you draw a line in the sand, that's it, that's our story. So when I started my business four years ago, my story was I was doing um, social media strategy. And then my business evolved and the landscape evolved and I became focused on startup marketing. Um, and if you looked at the about page in my, in my uh, website, it, there's probably easily hundreds of, of edits to that page where I change it all the time. So I read it, I don't like it because it doesn't reflect who I am and who I'm doing business with and, and who I want to do business with, and so I change my story. And I think the lesson that, that I'd leave you with is that your story is very fluid. Um, and when you create your story, it's just the beginning of a very long and ongoing um, journey um, that winds its way through as your business grows and as your as your consumers come and go, and as, you're, as you head out, want to head off a new direction. So always keep storytelling um, and never stop. That's the thing. It's just, it's just the way of the world these days. And that's probably the best lesson I can, I can leave you with. Thanks, Mark. Another excellent presentation. Um, Mark has given the Marketing Communications Lecture at Entrepreneurship 101 a number of times now. He's a big supporter of the program. And every year, the focus changes. So if you're interested in seeing his previous lectures, you can look them up on the video page on the Mars DD um, site. They're all excellent, so I highly recommend them. Thank you very much, Mark. And we'll see everyone else next week for Go to Market. <laughs> <laughs>